So welcome everybody. We've got people uh, dialing in from all over the world, which is fantastic as always. Um, and it's a pleasure tonight to welcome Andrew Elliott. Um, he is actually one of our Japan Research Center um, visiting scholars this year from Japan. Um, he's an associate professor um, in the Department of International Studies at Dorshisha Women's College in Kyoto. Um, unfortunately, none of us have been on campus since last March for almost a year, so we haven't actually managed to see Elliot in person, which is a shame. And when we were starting the seminar series last year, he, um, he purposefully selected a spring date tonight and we were both thinking at the time we'll be able to have it on campus and go to the pub afterwards but here we still are in lockdown so um thank you for your patience Elliot and I'm afraid uh, that it's just virtual tonight uh, as the series has been all year but it's a real pleasure to welcome you um Elliot's just had an article come out uh called Represent representations of the Perry mission in recent Japanese pop, pop culture so if anybody's interested in looking at that, that's in a book called Crossing Cultural Boundaries in East Asia and Beyond, uh, published by Brill. Um, but he's working, also working on a book at the moment, uh, which is the topic that he's going to be talking about tonight. He's working on a book about hospitality, international tourism and Anglophone travel writing in the Japanese Empire. Um, and I think now that we've all been sitting virtually here to hear about tourism tonight is just vicarious anticipation, frankly, because none of us have had any tourism for a year or more. So really looking forward to hearing about international travel and tourism tonight, even though it's a historic um, journey we're going to be taking. So Elliot's going to talk for about 45 minutes. Um, I'm going to sign off during that time so that he can upload his presentation and then we'll come back at the end. And as usual, please type any questions you'll have uh, for Elliot into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens and we'll collate those at the end and, and Elliot will be happy to answer them. So I'm going to hand over to him um, and let's get ready for a little international tourism. Over to you, Elliot. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction and, and thanks um, to the Japan Research Center for um, welcoming me and hosting me, especially Helen and Charles. Um, it's obviously been a very strange <laughs> sabbatical year so far. Um, I'm still holding out hope that I can meet everybody on campus um, before before I leave in August. Um, I don't know if this today's talk is really going to function very successfully as um, vicarious tourism or travel, um, but um, I'll, I'll do my best, I guess. So let me just um, share my screen. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see that. So. Um, Helen mentioned this, but today's um, talk is part of a larger project about inter-imperial travel and travel writing, tourism in the Japanese empire from the 1860s to 1941. Um, now my own background is, is in literature, and this began a fairly long time ago as a study of Anglophone travel writing on the Japanese empire. And I was interested in um, how post-colonial models of cross-cultural encounter and so on, how they fit the, the Japan case. Um, but more, more recently, as I began contextualizing um, these texts, it's, it's morphed into something that intersects um, more explicitly with work by historians um, of, um, of Japan, of modern Japan, and their work on tourism and also historical sociology as well of tourism. So I'm thinking of scholars like Kenneth Roth, Kate MacDonald, David Lahenny, um, Ariyama Terio, Akai Shoji, uh, Takagi Hiroshi, and so on. Um, and, but my approach, I don't know if this works as some kind of get out clause or not, but it's still a, a literary studies one, or at least I see it that way. So today I'm gonna look at hospitality, and I'll turn to this term soon, in relation to international tourism or Kokusai Kanko in Japan and the empire from 1912 to 1941. Um, now international tourism, this is a term in common usage um, in Japan in the 1930s. Now, as I pick it up here, um, I use it to refer to inbound tourism predominantly by visitors from Europe, um, mainly Britain and the USA, but also Australia and New Zealand and Canada as well. Now, these tourists are often referred to as gaikyaku or foreign guests, 
Uh, today, what I'll do is I'll consider this topic of hospitality and international tourism through readings of texts produced on the one hand by those offering hospitality to these tourists, and on the other hand, by the foreign guests accepting it. And what I'll argue or I'll suggest is that through this process of providing tourism hospitality to foreign visitors and the acceptance of it, a particular structure of host guest relations emerges, and this affirms a particular vision of nation, of empire for both hosts and guests. So let me just, um, just begin with a, a short background. I won't go over all this information there, just, just some of the key points in bold. So in 1912, the Japan um, Tourist Bureau is established. This is the first, um, it's a semi-governmental uh, Hankan Hanmin organization. But it's the first official organization to deal with tourism in Japan. Um, it, I'll refer to it as JTB, which is um, how it's known today, but, but I don't, that's not used until um, until much later. Now, the initial targets of um, JTB were um, European and American tourists, so attracting these tourists and promoting Japan and facilitating their travels. And this was um, uh, primarily for economic reasons at the beginning to bring in foreign capital. But tourism also from the beginning operates as an important field in which Japan could position and project itself as a modern civilized nation and a great power. Now, by the 1920s, JTB was mostly focused on Japanese travelers and inbound tourism of, of the kind I'm talking about was a, a fairly small part of a massive empire-wide industry. But in terms of arrival numbers and expenditure, international tourism's golden age um, was in the 1930s, and it continues to be of concern to policymakers as a means of national cultural propaganda, uh, kokujo bunka senden, even after numbers drop with the outbreak of war, well, of, of full-scale war in China in 1937. Now, it's within this, this context of the 1930s that the first central government agency for tourism is established, and that's the Board of Tourism Industry, uh, Koksai Kanko Kyoku. Um, and the board operated from 1930 to 1942. And for most of that period, it changes um, with the uh, changing international situation, but um, the um, tourists from the Europe and, and primarily Britain, European colonies across Asia, Australia, um, and most consistently the United States were the key targets and, until 1940, 41. And basically the start of the Pacific War brings an end to the type of tourists I'm concerned with. Um, there's a, uh, a graph here, hopefully you can see that. Um, this shows foreign visitor arrivals, just to give you an idea, from 1910 to 1940. The orange line at the top is total arrivals. Um, the gray line in the middle is, is from China. The um, green line is arrivals from USA and Britain, or at least those with um, uh, nationality um, from that, those countries. Um, now, so as you can see, um, aside from China and Manchuria, also arrivals from Manchuria or Manchukuo comes, um, they're counted um, in later years. And they're the biggest um, single source of um, arrivals um, through this period. But, um, but other than those, the USA and Britain are, are, um, make up the, um, the most um, arrivals. And, uh, in, in, in contrast to Chinese um, data shows, this was BTI surveys, which were done, uh, Board of Tourist Industry surveys, which were done in the mid 1930s, but most American arrivals came, came as tourists, and Chinese did not. And that's probably true of British and other European arrivals as well. So let me start the main um, uh, part of my talk with a couple of quotations. Let me start with a couple of quotes here. There's one from um, uh, 1913 uh, and there's one from 1920 here. And these show um, how uh, from the beginning uh, J um, JTB was um, concerned with the treatment of foreign guests. The first one is from the first um, edition of Tsuristo, which is JTB's um, trade magazine. And um, this is um, from a, a report by Bureau Secretary Shono Danroku, who has just come back from a field trip to tourism centers across Europe. And he's very impressed with the kind treatment of visitors, foreign visitors, which he experiences there. 
And in contrast, he argues that Japanese tourism operators focus only on making as much money as they can in the short term and the effects on the uh, national image um, which uh, rise from this. And similar worries are expressed um, fairly frequently over the next decade or so. And in 1920, this is the second quote here, the much stronger intervention is made by the chief executive of Nippon Sekiyu Oil Corporation, again in Suristo. I tried to translate this as closely as possible to the original. But he talks about um, there is a need not only to raise the level of service offered to foreign tourists, but for all Japanese to improve their understanding of foreigners in general. Um, skipping forward here, but from the viewpoint of a foreigner, I imagine the Japanese must appear at such moments like a squirrel or a sea cucumber or an offensive race of people. Um, so I start with these quotes because they illustrate how hospitality uh, can be and how it was by policy makers and industry leaders approached in two ways. Um, so the terms that tended to be used in industry reports, in guides and discussions in Japanese are uh, sabisu, or setai, or taigu, otai, uh, sekyaku, setsugu, or um, uh, osetsu. And in particular, uh, gaijin no setsugu, this phrase comes up a lot, welcoming or treatment of foreigners. And uh, just as an aside, but the, you know, the recent buzzword omotenashi um, does not appear in these um, texts. Now, probably the katakana loan word sabisu aside, the usage of these terms reveals a dual concern. With one, hospitality is the tourism and hospitality industry, and two, hospitality as, in the words of literary critic Paul Leons, meetings between peoples who are foreign to each other's social spaces. Now, this second sense of hospitality is worth exploring some more. So in this ideal form, hospitality describes the offering of a welcome to a stranger, which is acknowledged and reciprocated in kind. Yet in practice, new arrivals may fabricate a welcome when none was offered or understand a welcome in a way that allows the appropriation of land by guests, dispossession of hosts. Or conversely, and this is what particularly interests me today, um, as Jacques Derrida has argued, the selection of guests to whom the right of visiting is granted is an act of power that for hosts affirms the sovereignty of oneself over one's home. And that's the second, the, the second quotation at the bottom there. So gaijin no setsugu, welcoming the foreigner, was thus not only a question about reforming tourism service standards or using tourism as a promotional tool, but slipped quickly into questions about how and where to demarcate boundaries between Japan and its others, how to define national cultural attributes at home and abroad, and the real or imagined bounds of state sovereignty. And by the mid 1930s, tourism hospitality was being talked about in terms of a unique national resource instead of a national deficiency, both in overseas promotions, and there's just a quote um, exemplifying that here, and also for domestic audiences as well. But the idea of um, tourism hospitality was something that needed work, something that needed attention. This continued right up until the eve of the Pacific War. And there's lots of different strategies which are discussed and, and some of them implemented. And these vary a lot in scale um, and in quality um, and they change over time. So many of them are connected with the material aspects of the tourist experience. Some of them are really big like um, building or um, investing in new resort style hotels. Some of them concern things like opening times of cinemas or, or, or um, clubs. Others are about um, the provision of, of wine on trains or the color of bed linen, it's got to be white and clean. Um, the number of futons to be laid on the floor for foreign, um, foreign customers, foreign guests, the quality of souvenirs and so on. So the close attention paid by government to the minutia of the foreign tourist experience on top of large scale infrastructural investments and promotion is quite remarkable. And there's no real equivalent, I think, among European tourism agencies at the time. But hospitality reform also included intangible objects connected with social interactions, which were key to service encounters, behavior, posture, language, attitudes, and manners. And it's this latter aspect of state attempts to manage the tourism hospitality encounter that I'm particularly interested in and want to focus on next. We're gonna look first at the shaping of, of citizens or subjects as um, 
as hosts, and then second, the shaping of workers, and then the shaping of foreign visitors. So throughout the period, hospitality reforms were framed as a responsibility, not only of policy makers and providers, Shono Dan, Dan Roku again from 1913, we in the Bureau have an important part to play, of course, but so do the general public, Seji and Ippan, 1934 from the Board of Tourist Industry, Service also includes the hospitality of all citizens, Kokumin Ippa, towards foreign um, visitors. Now, this molding of the touristic host nation took many forms. And magazines like Turisto played their part. There's also radio programs, tourism festivals, department store exhibitions, and primary school textbooks, which are used to popularize the idea of tourism. Now, these are not solely aimed at improving the inbound tourist experience, but one proposal made in 1939 certainly was, and this was to open Japanese homes as short-term accommodation for visitors. And this was um, proposed as a unique way for foreigners to learn about the essence of Japan. Now, schemes like this were presented as strategies to attract and entertain visitors, but they also positioned host citizens or host subjects, perhaps, in a particular relationship to both guests and the national cultural community as loyal, welcoming subjects. Okay, next I'd like to turn to the question of shaping of front stage workers. So um, there were, in order to, 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 um, to, to mold or manage or, um, or, or train workers in particular, uh, service styles, particular ways of, of, of working and interacting with guests, um, particularly the Board of Tourist Industry uh, held guidance and training Kantoku Shido sessions, and these were seminars or lectures, film screenings, roundtable discussions, um, which were particularly for front stage workers like guides or workers in hotels in Ryokan and the souvenir trade. It's also professional qualifications, um, which are set up at this time as well. But basically, these are for the for workers on the front line, daichi uh, sen ni tate of the industry. Um, now, on screen, you can see um, a, a large number of um, training manuals that were published for workers. Now, again, in mo most of these are published in the in the nineteen thirties. The earliest is nineteen twenty eight that I've found so far. Although actually, there are some um, translations and things which, which which are earlier than that. Um, now these are published by national organizations, so like JTB and the Board of Tourist Industry, regional organizations like Kyoto's Tourist Association, and also Hokuriku um, um, Onsen uh, Kyokai, the Onsen Association in, in Hokuriku, uh, Kofu is somewhere there, Kanko Kyokai, and Harbin as well. So. Um, and, and also these are published by private businesses like steamship um, companies, ryokan owners, and hotel management. Now, some of these are, are, are aimed specifically at, um, at, at foreign guests or, or training, sorry, training workers to, um, to, to welcome and, and service foreign guests. But some of them are general, but, but in almost all cases, there's one chapter or two within them, which deals with the particular, or what are seen as the particular needs of foreign guests. Now, manuals like this are part and parcel of movements towards rational management in tourism that were occurring elsewhere in the world at the same time. And um, the BTI in particular is also translating a lot of um, uh, particularly English language and um, training manuals from, from around the world, translating those into Japanese. And also if you go to the, um, the, the JTB library in Tokyo, you can find um, a lot of English language um, training worker training service, worker training books with the um, Board of Tourist Industry stamp suggesting that they were, they were in the library and there for research purposes. But the amount of text also reflects an understanding that, um, uh, uh, and this is a quote, it is the kindness and joy of the staff more than the quality of facilities that lead to positive consumer experiences. But it's also perhaps important that labor was relatively cheap and emotional and aesthetic labor is also far cheaper investment than um, than, than building or a new um, a, a new ryokan or, or or renovating the facilities in any in any um fundamental way 
there's a great deal of repetition um, between these texts in the kind of practical advice they offer. And they do offer very practical advice as well as um, more, more general discussions about hospitality towards um, foreign guests. So some of the advice they give, things like, um, you know, how, how you should laugh um, with, with foreign guests or, or when you should not laugh, um, that you shouldn't whisper in front of foreign guests, um, uh, to not leave foreign guests waiting, um, to um, not be silent when something's been said, um, always, always answer, um, and also things like who to let into a room first and, and, and a lot of other things. Um, other, other things might be like, don't stare at a foreigner as if a rare beast, it's a quote there. And another quote, um, don't call them Danasama, use their actual family names like Mr. K uh, Caramel or, or Mr. Cabbage and that's Kabetsu-san and uh, Kiaramelu-sama. And this makes them feel more at home. Now, generally, manuals advise against conversations about the state of the world, politics, or religion. But one important exception is JTB's Bureau Yomihon, the Bureau Reader from 1936. And this is quite a tome, 600 pages of, of detailed advice and, 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 and information about JTB's work. Uh, it calls itself the Tourist Professionals um, Textbook at the beginning. Now this gives all the usual kind of advice, but it also gives some explicitly politicized um, instruction to guides. Do not stop with the introduction of a landscape, shrine and temple, but progress to an explanation about the spirit of Japanese culture and the national polity, kokutai. Um, also more generally, both the board and JTB recommended that tourism workers uh, correct their own um, apparently deficient knowledge about Japan as a necessary first step in providing information to foreign guests. And among the works they advised JTB workers to read were official English language promotional or and perhaps propaganda literature, we might say, that aimed to provide correct ideas. That's tekikaku naru kannen, that's um, from a BTA explanation of these about Japan to foreign readers, in particular the How to See and the Tourist Library series pictured here. Now this suggests how the process of shaping service providers into good hosts entailed more than simply learning about their foreign clientele's tastes and customs. Rather, it demanded self-fashioning as a national subject. And fundamentally, in these texts, this host-guest encounter is depicted dialectically in very broad oppositional terms as foreign customs and Japanese customs. So in that sense, any participating worker becomes relationally defined as Japanese. And, and a really nice example of this is from, um, from texts about the ryokan in Japanese. And when they're discussing the ryokan in um, in relation to Japanese guests, they refer to it as ryokan, but in, in the same book, but in a different chapter, when it's discussed in relation to foreign guests, it, it becomes Nihon ryokan, Japanese, um, uh, uh, Japanese ryokan. And so it emerges as Japanese only in relation to foreign, to the foreign here. Now, so, but into the 1930s, we do see that tourism leaders were much more explicit in framing tourism service work as a form of national service. Workers are representatives of Japan and should act, speak in line with national policy. Workers should be proud of themselves as Japanese and offer high class service to foreigners on those terms, etc. Now this process of national self-fashioning is neatly expressed in an essay within a BTI produced English dictionary for workers. Um, the uh, Gai uh, Kyoku Setsuru Ego Kaiwa from 1937. And this says, before engaging with foreign tourists as international people, Kokusai Jin, workers need to strengthen at their core their Japanese-ness. And this is phrased very nicely, uchi ni nihonjin toshite no hara o shikari ano skute oku beki. My third category um, of hospitality reform is connected with the shaping of guests. So in discussions in the 1910s and 1920s, the onus for um, adaptation is on the side of um, hosts. So basically what do we need to do to meet um, visitor service needs 
and standards. But in the 1930s, sees a new assertiveness in the selection and shaping of foreign guests. And by 1940, this will be expressed by the BTI in terms of offering a warm welcome to, and this is the phrase which interests me, well-intentioned or perhaps bona fide foreign holiday makers, Zeni no Raiyu Gaijin. Now, one way this took place was in the selection of guests for guided tours of the empire. And, and this is important and interesting, but there's not time to go into it here. And Nakamura Hiroshi and Abe Junichiro um, have also looked, have looked at this in more detail. But another way, and this is what I want to focus on here, was through promotional literature um, aimed at foreign tourists. And there's some examples on the screen here, They're all produced by uh, uh, all but one of them produced by the Board of Tourist Industry, or JTB, and the inns and hotels in Japan is produced by uh, Fujiya Hotel in Hakone. Um, now, these kinds of texts, they, in, in, they, can, they might be approached or read in terms of a kind of depiction of the ideal visitor. And in that sense, they worked as an instruction on how to be a tourist in Japan. But typically we think of tourist guidebooks and pamphlets. Um, we think of them that we think that they focus on, they tend to focus on what to see, right? But this type of literature focuses on, what to, on how to act, what to say, how to listen. Now, English language guides to the Ryokan illustrate this well. Uh, within the international tourism market, um, the Ryokan had a pretty, a relatively low status until into the Showa period. So in the 1910s, uh, Ryokans are not promoted very much, and they were mentioned as a, uh, in terms of uh, as a backup, basically, accommodation for use only when there was no Western style hotels. Um, Official advice for the Orkan operators continued along these lines. So you have to make changes for foreign guests to be able to um, comfortably um, stay at the Orkan. But, but there's increasing stress is laid on the role that foreign guests must themselves play in adapting their own um, expectations and behavior. So at the top quote here, as it says, if they are broad-minded enough, if they act as Romans do, then they'll probably be able to turn inconvenience and discomfort into an interesting study and experience. But by the 1930s, the demands of a Ryokan stay are being promoted in a much more positive fashion. It's not just a comfortable place to stay, but it's a necessary part of any genuine trip to Japan. The bottom quote here, just I'll just read the final sentence, but the novel experience will afford one of the best opportunities to learn something the real life of the Japanese. That's, there's no date for that, but it's sometime in the, um, in the uh, 1930s. Now, increasingly, promoters suggested that staying at a ryokan permits an embodied experience of national cultural essence for the foreign guests. So taking off one's shoes at the entrance, following the maid to the sparsely furnished room, kneeling on a cushion by the hibachi stove, sipping green tea, changing into a yukata, bathing, lying on the futon. So the ryokan is presented here as a repository of traditional Japan, to which foreign guests, by progressing through each step of their stay, must themselves accommodate. And the corporality of this process seems important to me. So this is no um, like disembodied tourist gaze, surveying the landscape from up on high. Rather, these texts foreground a tourist body, not always, but often male, moving around in relation to other bodies, usually female, and objects, the bath, the futon, the yukata, etc. Now through these movements, the literature suggests the tourist is made at home in Japan, rather than Japan made home for the foreign visitor. And an essayist in a 1939 tourist special puts it like this, the quote at the bottom of the page. After you've taken off your European dress and put on a fresh smelling kimono, you would not think your room to be bare. So by giving oneself up to this experience, the tourist is transformed, acquiring new, avowedly Japanese, ways of thinking about aesthetics, space, time, nature, and perhaps international politics. Now, a kind of official version of the ideal relationship between Japanese host and foreign guest is neatly depicted in Three Weeks Trip in Japan, 
This is a book published by the Board of Tourist Industry sometime after the beginning of the Second Sino-Japanese War, so sometime after 1937. And this dramatizes a fictional summer holiday by an American couple, Herbie and Gertrude Bowles, and their interactions with their JTB guide, Mr. Sato. They travel the length of Honshu from um, Tokyo um, to Kyushu. Now, the American couple, as depicted in this, have a very uncritical, a very naive interest in Japan. They're always willing to listen to Sato's explanations. But importantly as well, Sato's own travel experience is underscored and contrasted with the Americans. So he has firsthand experience and knowledge about the world. And he also has um, knowledge and experience about what it means to be a mobile and modern tourist consumer, able to go and take pleasure anywhere. Golf comes up, drinking comes up, etc. Thus, through the course of their travels together, it's Sato who teaches Gertrude and Herbie not only about the real Japan, not, you know, real Japan, but about what it means to be a bona fide traveler. And now mostly this means the, the willingness to listen and learn from Japan. Um, and the top quote here is an example of that. Yeah, at the end of their journey, it is described as the cosmopolitan transformation of Gertrude and Herbie. This trip has been a real education to us both. We feel internationally minded for the first time in our lives. So let me just review some of the main points um, at this stage. Um, so from the early 1910s to 1930s, ideas of inbound tourism hospitality changed from a shameful national deficiency to a superlative national resource. You can see this in the, um, the guidance and um, given to front stage um, and training, given to front stage workers in the mobilizing of subjects as host citizens and the selection and shaping of foreign guests. By the late 1930s, host guest relations are articulated as mutual and equal, involving both shared accommodation to each other's different cultural traits and identification as a validly universal modern subjects of tourism. But the question remains then, what took place on the ground? How could the state or industry leaders ensure that the moment of service delivery worked as desired? How did individual workers follow or bend or resist the scripts laid out for them? Um, how did tourists themselves participate in these service encounters? How did they represent these experiences? So in the last part of this paper, I'd like to turn from official policy and publications an attempt to recover some of the local and individual experiences of providing and receiving hospitality in mainland Japan and colonial territories. Now, this is a work which is still very much in progress. And methodologically speaking, it's more difficult. Um, um, so front stage workers of the kind um, which I'm talking about here, um, they rarely make records of, of work themselves and these are even more rarely published um, there's a lot of photographs and visual records of workers but these are not self-commissioned um, they tend to be official commemoration shots of um, of hotel workers for example as, as the bottom one here from the Osaka hotel or the images um, for the souvenir trade as, as the top one there um, a postcard for um, NYK line um, steamer line and um, other photographs taken by tourists as mementos. But if they show the encounter at all, they provide little sense how it took place on the ground. And one exception is a, which I found so far is a biographical narrative of Ryokan made life and work called Ryokan no Jochu Niki Monogatari from 1921. And it's um, written by Fujikawa His Hisui. And this purports to be a collection of written and orally transmitted episodes from a variety of different mates. And these are collated into a narrative form by the author. And this paints a very sympathetic portrait of long days and serious efforts to please guests, often using a rhetoric of ninjo, heartfulness or human feelings. And this is very common in discussions, official discussions of the Ryokan as well. However, this um, memoir, also reveals a, um, a private realm of 
um, sociability behind the scenes, which is detached from maids face-to-face -face interactions with guests. It goes unseen by the guests themselves. Our guests are peered at, they're in secret, they're laughed at, they're sympathized with, uh, and also ignored. And for example, um, and for example, Ninjo is invoked in such passages in more personal ways, as in the quote here, to explain Maid's um, curiosity about what guests are doing and how in this occasion they would go out into the corridor, patrolling the corridor, but, but in truth to get a look in at a particular guest's room. Now this suggests a gap between totalizing rhetorics of service as personal sacrifice, you know, these kinds of um, uh, exhortation, ex ex exhortations you get, like always smile, however you're feeling, don't stare at guests, even if you want to, etc. It suggests a gap between that kind of rhetoric and actual practices. But it's hard to read conscious resistance from this alone, of course. Now more readily than workers, tourists write of their meetings and interactions with hospitality workers of all kinds with differing degrees of detail or individuation. Now, this is travel logs, basically, I'm talking about travel essays. Now, these offer, of course, a highly mediated perspective from only one side of the encounter, but perhaps a reading of them against as well as with the grain offers a way to access aspects of this encounter. Now, travel logs usually describe ryokan service much more than hotel service um, at length. And then mirroring Japanese service manuals, they pay close attention to maids as a sign of attentive and unobtrusive service. Now, this is the kind of disciplined, docile, often female bodies that modern tourism tends to front stage. Um, and there's lots of um, sociology of tourism work on this. But modifiers such as young, female, kimono clad, bright, tiny, little, smiling, also draw on long running tropes of often eroticized female hospitality that has particular resonance in the case of Japan. So there's a complex exchange and interplay of signs here. We've got female um, bodies in kimonos, which have been utilized at this time as national um, symbols in tourism promotions inside and outside Japan. We've got maids in kimono being framed as conduits for the transmission of national cultural essence in inbound tourism practices. And this draws on and perhaps feeds, in the case of some male guests, single male guests, orientalist fantasies of Japan, as well as the Ryokan's prehistory as site of sex work and sexual play. So the modern Ryokan maid is captured, as it were, at the intersection of all these discourses. But travelogues also record encounters when maid servants challenge attempts to use them, either as a national resource to promote Japan or as an object of erotic orientalist desire. So maid servants are reported giggling in corridors at foreign tourists' and inability to use chopsticks. They share gossip about foreign guests with other staff. Uh, they play tricks on inhospitable guests after they have left. And such examples correspond with episodes in the maid diary narrative mentioned earlier. They also correspond with the repeated advice found in service manuals not to do just these types of things. You get the impression that they're having to repeat the same advice over, over, over a decade or so because um, it's necessary because the advice is not being followed. Now, of all the service encounters reported on in travelogues, by far the most important is guides. And they spend the longest time with tourists and they play the most prevalent role in accounts. They are named as maid servants, a hotel staff typically were not, and they have the dialogue directly quoted. And many of the conversations reported with guides in travelogues are conversations about Japan in which the guide plays the role of a national speaking subject, a wee Japanese constructed against a tourist identified as American, British, or Western. And this role, guides explain the national situation in very positive ways, and they correct visitors' ideas about Japan. And such accounts closely align the BTI's training of guides with tourists' real experiences. It's of course worth noting that tourists wished often to speak and hear about these things, and that's the reason they chose to employ guides in the first place. But I think all of this is perhaps less significant than the intimate associations made between guide and tourist. So their relationship is typically described using a rhetoric of friendship. 
Travel books often present guides less as Japanese host than as a fellow traveler. Shared experiences of eating, traveling, and staying together are shown to bring travelers and guides together. But their shared desires for relaxed and comfortable accommodation, decent souvenirs, picturesque sites, and interesting experiences are just as important. That is, Visitors and guides are shown to have similar touristic expectations and understandings to be cultured and mobile in similar ways. On the basis of this shared touristic identity with visitors, intimate associations are formed. Class and gender both play a key role in this ability to make an effective connection. All the guides are male, and even, well, perhaps especially for female tourists who write, um, who tend to adopt a travel um, identity um, conventionally coded masculine, um, connected with unbeaten tracks, solo travel, adventure, etc. And also guides are shown to be well-educated, humanistic, often cosmopolitan, but well-traveled, just like for the foreign tourists, and accomplished in English. And this is something we see in, in three weeks, we've seen in three weeks trip in Japan. So the shared traveled object of guides and tourists alike the travelee, the person traveled, as Mary Pratt puts it, is positioned in opposition. They're often female, as in the maid servants of Yorkan, rural, lower class, and in the case of tra traveling colonial territories, racially or ethnically different. And this class and gendered identification and its exclusions, this exposes the inevitable limits of the Board of Tourist Industries drive to popularize um, tourism across the nation in accord with prevailing social hierarchies and prejudices and inequalities, promoters framed certain groups as objects for other more privileged groups to observe. So I'd like to finally take this idea and think about travel further field in the empire. So travelogues report on Japanese colonialism in various ways. Some are critical, others are indifferent, many are supportive. But even when travel writers are openly critical, the acceptance of tourism hospitality provided by Japanese institutions and individuals tends to work implicitly to justify colonial intervention on the basis of touristic protection and comfort. The first quote here from Neil James's Petticoat Vagabond in Ainuland um, from a travel in 1940 41 illustrates this well. Now, passages like this are particularly explicit in establishing an equivalence between the good guidance of tourism hospitality and good guidance of colonial rule. Now, as we see in the, the second quote here from Harold and Alice Fort's trip to Hokkaido and Taiwan, even elements of tourism service that are coded Japanese in mainland Japan, such as futons and baths or fudo, become in the colonies sign of a familiar type and standard of tourism hospitality. And travelers, after um, after a long day adventuring in a strange place, they're glad to return to these, um, to these services, to these facilities. So Japan is coded home-like and familiar in such passages. So similar to the guides to Ryokan stays produced for foreign visitors I looked at before, it's through the body and bodily comfort that an effective attachment to Japan is made. So I'm just gonna to turn to my conclusion now. Um, so I don't wish to suggest that on the ground encounters between service workers and tourists, um, at least as they're recorded in travelogues, um, I don't wish to suggest these aligned precisely with how this encounter was mapped out or imagined in policy or promotional literature. So there are travelogues, New Zealand to James Bertram, for example, Auden and Isherwood, who make a self-reflective and critical stand against the pull of the touristic. There are also structural blocks to the smooth operation of hospitality, the home ministry, the police and army restricted inbound tourist movements increasingly through the 1930s. Um, and we can also wonder whether nationalist appeals to service workers to see all interactions as an exercise in cultural diplomacy made much real headway with staff themselves. Finally, even in the pages of JTB and BTI's own magazines, there are conflicting opinions. And some of these critique the idea of inbound tourism and hospitality as a means to promote Japan in a prescribed totalizing way. 
But in conclusion, I do want to make a point about the power of touristic identities and relationships that perhaps overrides many of these concerns. The Japanese state's approaches to inbound tourism was based arguably on a reasonable understanding of tourism's workings. Tur touristic perspectives and representations lean towards inductive readings of places and people, where individual instances are generalized and essentialized as a sign of national character. And this makes, of course, each encounter an important one. And the BTI was well aware and, and discussed this in, in its own reports that a single negative experience can outweigh a multitude of positive experiences on a trip. Furthermore, the nature of overseas travel meant that national or imperial comparisons could be and were made. Tourism was thus an effective tool for both evaluating civilizational progress against a real and imagined West and projecting a positive national image. Now, in the end, and the impact of tourism as propaganda was limited by, by the news and, and reports coming out of, of, of China, for example, from, from um, over the 1930s. Um, but attempts to oversee and manage the tourist, touristic experience in Japan were generally quite successful, I think. So many travel accounts, they report on positive, pleasurable experiences of travel in Japan in um, and empire right up until the eve of the Pacific War. And in these accounts, tourism service workers were often acclaimed for their hospitality. And this is understood not individually, but as a positive reflection on, um, uh, on Japan as nation and imperial state. It's not understood secular um, in terms of the um, uh, tourism sector either. It's understood um, um, uh, nationally or imperially here, or in terms of imperial state. Now, Kenneth Rofe, in his work on imperial heritage tourism, argues that tourism exemplified self-administered citizenship training. And that is a voluntary engagement with an endorsement of prevailing imperial ideology through mass consumerism and consumption. Now, in the cases I have outlined today, we see something different. On the one hand, how practices are providing tourism to foreign guests rather than touristic consumption worked on citizens, mobilizing them as loyal, welcoming subjects in support of national policy. And on the other hand, how tourism hospitality led to the development of effective ties with the nation for individuals from outside Japan, many without any other significant attachment to the country or its people. Yet the reason for tourism's eff efficacy here lay not in control of the scripts according to which these encounters took place. The particularities of, of what service providers said to visitors, what information they imparted, just like the particularities of an itinerary or the way particular sites were framed or experienced, I, I think all of this is much less relevant for foreign tourists than it was for Japanese imperial or imperial heritage tourism. Again, I'm thinking of work by Kenneth Rofe and Kate McDonald here. So tourists were directed to the Imperial Palace. They were directed to the Issei Grand Shrines, to model Aboriginal villages in Hokkaido and Taiwan, to modern urban spaces in Korea, to Russo-Japanese war memorials in Manchuria, et cetera, et cetera. But the ascribed nationalist or imperial meaning of these sites is rarely accorded special significance in texts, even when it is mentioned. And as tourist attractions, these jostle with food, with street scenes, with shopping, the weather, sports, transportation, as just one more thing out there for tourists' attention. So rather, I argue that inbound tourism was effective because of something more fundamental to um, tourism hospitality ideals. That is prevailing ideas about what it means to be a good tourist or good guest not overstaying one's welcome, not imposing one's values, being sensitive to and respectful of difference. Now these admittedly, and perhaps for good reason, are not characteristics that immediately perhaps come to mind when thinking about the history of modern Western travel or travel writing to Japan, especially in the wake of decades of post-colonial studies analysis. Still, however travelers chose to interpret what it means to be a good guest, or how they put this into practice. Into the 20th century, at least, their encounters and interactions are underpinned by a fairly strong commitment to basic principles of hospitality. 
that encourage an at least temporary incorporation of the guest within the cultural and social norms of the host society. But what version or vision of the host society from whose perspective, by being a good host, drawing on and developing a vision of what it meant to be touristic that was shared with guests, international tourism providers, from policymakers to front stage workers, positioned foreign visitors in a particular relationship to Japan, to the lower and upper classes, to colonial territories and subject peoples. Um, and that's the end of my talk. So thank you very much. Thanks, Elliot. That was brilliant. Um, just a reminder to type your questions into the Q&A function. I see there's some coming in. There's some sitting there, so we'll get to those in a second. Um, but thank you. That was brilliant. Um, I just have one, uh, just to get the ball rolling while people are typing in their questions. I have one um, sort of very broad question myself and then a comment. Um, it's, it's really fascinating to see you trace this history of, of inbound tourism or Japan as hosting tourism um, back to as early as, as you know the 1910s as you did and we know that um, and you said at the very beginning that you know the JTB was was sort of set up to to you know um, promote Japanese going abroad or Japanese going to outbound tourism uh, so focus on inbound tourism has been much you know much less significant than that but it's interesting the history that you've got there and the meticulous investment in that um, but it's only in the last five years, I believe it was 2014-15, where inbound tourism for the first time in Japanese history overtook Japanese outbound tourism in terms of numbers. So I just want, I mean, I've got some theories myself, but I just wanted to get your view on why is it taken a century for inbound tourism to really take off uh, in terms of numbers of inbound tourists coming mm. into Japan? I just I'd, I'd welcome your view on that. Mm -hmm. And the second, um, it's more of a comment really, but I've done a little bit, I've been doing a little bit of work on, on tourism and its relation to sport recently. And uh, there was, a, there was a, a basic act on sports promotion in 2011 and, and you know, promoting Japan as a, as a as sports tourism, both domestically and internationally. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why Japan has been hosting mega events like the Rugby World Cup. And unfortunately, the, the 20, uh, 2020 Olympics and Paralympics won't be the same tourism um, uh, hosting opportunity that it, that it could have been but it's interesting that to see in your um history little bits of sports were there so you mentioned golf you, there was some pictures there of fishing and hiking and these are the types of things that japan is really focusing on in terms of connecting specific sports activities to to tourism so it's interesting to see that that perhaps started off much earlier than than I realized, for example. So I don't know if you want to comment on that, how, to what degree those kinds of activities were being encouraged and the regional span of that, because you said people were being directed to specific places, which even now you can say that inbound tourists to Japan are, are, are directed to specific places or sites in Japan, but to what extent do people go off the beaten track maybe is, is another question. So if you want to think about those while I start to collate some Sure. Questions from the chat as well. Mm, thank you very much. Yeah, um, about the the sports um, uh, question or uh, comment first. Yeah. Um, so, I mean the, the the I mean there's two kind of um, uh, approaches to to how these tourist bodies like JTB or a board of tourist industry um, approach sport as a to, as an activity. Um, for um, tourists in Japan, and, it, and it's also for domestic tourists actually, and there's a lot of overlap here. But in one sense, I mean, they're surveying, of course, um, Western tourists all the time, I mean, particularly 1920s and 30s. Um, but this, what do foreign tourists want, basically? Because they want them to um, stay longer is, is, a, is, is a big thing by the 1930s. Um, and they also want them to spend more money um, so I mean, what do foreign tourists like to do? And of course, things like um, play tennis, um, um, uh, golf. Um, um, I mean, all of these, these come up a lot, right? The other thing which is important is trying to get tourists to come at different times of the year because most tourists come in April for cherry blossoms, much like um, still today, of course. And um, they came in summer, um, you know, not 
uh, for summering off uh, when summer holidays, right? And many, many that are coming from <laughs> Shanghai or Hong Kong, right? On summering vacations. So they also want to attract people and throughout tourists throughout the year. So skiing, of course, mm. is winter sports and skating. These become, I mean, there's a lot of promotion of this in the 30s. And this is an attempt to kind of spread um, uh, um, tourism um, uh, um, numbers across the year, to raise, raise it across the year. But this is something they're also doing with, with domestic tourists as well. Um, not something I've looked at, but, but other, others have worked on this where the um, Ministry of Railways and JATB, I mean, people travel at the same time. So they have all these like tourist tickets for the, for the trains, for example. But I mean, there's massive peaks at certain times of the year, and then there's no use of these other times of the year. So trying to, trying to not just spread out tourist numbers, but increase tourist numbers at all times of the year. So I think sports plays, plays, plays a role in that. Mm -hmm. But also in the 30s, um, you also have the recreational, I think that's right, recreational health movement, which is, um, and, and there's an overlap here with the um, uh, German strength through joy um, tourism and leisure movements here, where there's an attempt to, um, to, um, uh, to, to, to frame and promote tourism and leisure activities as wholesome and healthy, um, as opposed to being kind of goraku, like um, um, being um, kind of uncontrolled or, or low or um, you know mm. involving drinking and, and and this kind of thing so so I think sports play and hiking like getting people out in groups into the countryside the mm. Japanese countryside is is a part of this and and foreign um, and foreign tourists are are, are, are kind of um, you know embroiled in this as well I mean, you know, the surveys, I, mean, I know I'm talking quite a long time on this maybe, but the surveys, I mean, the foreign tourists are saying things like, we want to go out later to clubs and cinemas closed too early, right? But the BTI, this is 1937, 1938, is like, well, but, you know, that may well be so, but we have to think of the laws and customs of Japanese who like to go to bed early. So instead we'll give them a recreational sports facility. So, I mean, so, them out. So, a, <laughs> yes, yeah. so they won't go out late um so i mean there's a, there's a negotiation going on here of mm. course inevitably um and just in terms of your first question about why inbound tourism took so long um i mean distances and technology play presumably a huge part in this right that i mean compared to the meiji period when you having I mean, there's not many much data about, um, not much data about the Meiji period, but um, you can, there's data about um, not tourism, tourist arrivals, but about people who entered the interior. And we're talking about like a thousand or so for an entrance to the interior in the 1880s or something like that. And, and, and that might be more residents as well, foreign residents than, than, than short term mm. visitors. So when you're getting 10,000 people from the US or 9,000 people from the U from Britain or British um, uh, citizens coming in the 1930s, I mean, those numbers are quite high, of course, right? Yeah, relative, AG. yeah. Um, yeah, and, and that's partly because of changing technologies, right? And um, it's much, the steamship ride is, is relatively quick and by the 1920s and comfortable. We've got the Trans-Siberian Express as well, bringing people in by train. There's, through tickets which are which around the world through tickets so so technology combined with um tourism um, and transport facilities um just make it a lot easier to get in there and of course um the airplane um changed mm. a lot but i mean i mean what you know why now in the post i mean presumably because most of the recent tourists are chinese right or korean i think south korean um and most of the i mean there's a lot of the tourists who are coming in um, are, are mostly, um, not entirely, but mostly coming, the ones coming from outside the empire, especially the Japanese empire, are coming in from Europe, from uh, North America, and from um, increasingly Australia, actually, mm -hmm. um, in the late 1930s, is, is, is a push towards promoting Japan as a tourist destination in Australia. Mm -hmm. then. Um, Interesting. But they have Thank an excessive you. power. Mm, yeah, yeah. 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 Brilliant. Okay, let's go to some questions. Um, 
There's a quick one here. Uh, did museums, galleries and exhibitions play an important role um, in, the, in that time period that you're looking at in terms of international tourism? I mean, uh, yeah, so they, in guidebooks, of course, they do. Um, uh, museums are mentioned, exhibitions are mentioned, and you've got the expositions, of course, which um, the, the one off or annual or, or um, expositions which play an important part in inbound tourism from a very early point, right? So, I mean, 1872 has the Kyoto, I would say, called the Arts and Arts and Industry Industrial Exposition exhibition. 1872, I think, is the first one, and that's the first time that um, that normal foreigners are able to apply for a passport to enter Kyoto, and that is set up partly to revive Kyoto after the Meiji, um, uh, after the you know the capital moves to to Tokyo. But it's also, but part of that revival strategy is bringing in foreign tourists to do that. So from a very early point, you have expositions there, and of course, Japan's is sending out through the nine. 1930s is sending out um, pavilions to the world. Well, I mean, sending out pavilions from a very early point, right? But in the 1930s, tourism and tourism promotion plays a big part in um, the Japan pavilions and in, in, say, New York in, in, in 1939-40 and the San Francisco um, exposition in 1939-40, where Board of Tourism, in G, JTB, they, um, you know, the the the, the put a lot of money, I mean, very beautiful, very nicely designed um, work to try and use, use expositions to attract tourists there, yeah. Thank you. Um, a question here that this, um, you know, the shaping of the front stage workers or that meticulous investment and in how they were to host, you know, um, foreign uh, visitors. So um, Tracy asks, were there guides already for, you know, Japanese to Japanese guest interaction, or was this something that was accelerated, this, this investment in service design, was that accelerated by having to deal with foreigners and foreign tourists, or was it there already that they were building on? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so the, I mean, the guide emerges I mean, as as a I mean, from the foreign tourist perspective, the guide emerges like an interpreter guide in the in the Meiji period and this early period of modern inbound tourism, modern travel to Japan, um, and that's a, that that position of the interpreter guide because uh, they know English and later French and German perhaps. Um, so that that is a very specific kind of um, you know job for foreign tourists um, and they would travel around with the with with them around the country typically mm -hmm. um, but it becomes harder and I mean it, supposedly I mean from what I've read it becomes harder and harder for guides to find enough work because there's not the need for um, a guide in the um, 1920s or 30s you, you certainly don't need someone following um, going around with you all the time so guides become more localized and you have a, you, you, you employ a new guide in Kyoto for example but but JTB have their own guides and on the guided tours, but also you can get your own JTB guide. And, and they're the ones which of course the, um, which, which is the focus of many of these efforts by BTI. And you need professional qualifications by this point. You need to be registered with the police, for example, to be a guide. In terms of what Japanese tourists were doing, yeah. I mean, there is, yeah, I mean, there's, in the 1910s, all JTBs, all the discussions are really about inbound focus, but inbound tourists, sorry. But but very quickly, I mean, the domestic tourist market in the 1920s is just, I mean, is huge. It becomes huge, and 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 it's it spreads across the the empire, right? And and that is not connected with um, with 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 foreign tourists. Mm. Um, so foreign tourists are using facilities which are for the for the most part designed and used by Japanese tourists mm. domestic tourists themselves right? and that's transport and that's um hotels for example and things like that yeah well actually that links to a question here from Nicole about the empire so she's asking how often did um tourists who also visited Japan also visit one of the colonies or all explore all of the empire and was the itinerary for the colonies particularly politicized in any way? Mm. Yeah, um, 
So, I mean, from a, a again, a, a very early point, I mean, in the already in like 1916 or something like that, um, JTB is talking about tourism to the new territories. So Korea, for example, um, that's six years, I think after annexation, right? So, I mean, tourism is, 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 is expanding with the empire there. And, um, but, but there's not, from what I can gather, I mean, one, one problem is that I'm, I'm basing a, a lot of this, unfortunately, or ne necessarily on travel logs. Um, so, you know, how representative are they, et cetera, et cetera. It's a important questions, right? But there's not much, there's not until the 1920s, you begin to see yeah, um, foreigners um, um, traveling to Japan and then traveling to other places in, in the empire or traveling through colonial territories to get to Japan. And of course, the, the key ones here are um, Korea and um, and uh, South Manchuria and then Manchukuo because of the transport links, basically. So people are coming down by train or they're leaving Japan um, by a moji or um, to go to Pusan and then going up and around, perhaps doing round trips. A lot of people coming out of China, of course, doing these uh, much larger kind of Asian, East Asian tours as well, which, which go through the Japanese um, empire. Taiwan, there's, there are, um, again, from the 1920s and into the 1930s, there's a lot more promotion of Taiwan as a tourist destination. But um, Karafuto, for example, I mean, there's the, I think the JTB have an office up there or something, but there's no talk about going there. I mean, by, 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 I haven't found any examples of that. And again, the, the South, um, South Pacific Mandate Islands, the uh, Nanyo, again, um, there's, it's, um, I haven't found, there's, there's Willard Price's quite well-known book called Japan's Island of Mysteries, which is from 1938 or 1939 or something. But he has real trouble getting into the Nanyo at that point because um, they think he's a, I mean, I mean, this is all based on his, but I think he's a spy. It's hard mm. to get permission to travel around it. Um, but going there, and he's there on a kind of fact-finding mission. He's, right, he's a uh, journalist and writer. But so tourists going there, you, 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 I've not found any examples mm. right yet. Um, yeah. Great. But it's that. Mm, yeah. um, our SOAS colleague, um, or JSC colleague Fabio, asked a question about the now ubiquitous omotenashi. Um, and you mentioned lots of different um, words there at the beginning. So he's asking, you know, the origins of omotenashi, which is now commonly used, you know, so he's asking, um, what were more pragmatic words basically um, replaced by, so did, did sort of high culture notion of a motonashi descend into common usage is basically what he's asking. Sorry, Fabio, you, you said it very eloquently and I've paraphrased it not so eloquently, but the origins of a motonashi. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, did look, I did have a quick kind of Google search or Google trend search for a motonashi usage recently. And just to see like when uses of it, I mean, in terms of, internet searches peaked in Japan. And of course, it's all connected really with uh, Crystal uh, Takigawa, is it? Her 2013 um, speech in, in Brazil when, when she was a, uh, as a bid ambassador for the um, Tokyo Olympics, when she did this, you know, I mean, so you know, omote nashi she did, and then omote nashi she did. And this, I mean, I remember from my own students, like, you know, for the next two years, this was suddenly a buzzword, which they, which they all talked about. No one had, I don't think, I, it wasn't a word which was in common parlance really bef before then, as far as I know. I mean, it hasn't this longer history, right, connected with um, Japanese hospitality through, you know, the Edo period and, and, and beyond, which has a different, I mean, uh, and similar in many respects, but has a, its own history, right, as a, as a practice and, and as a word. And um, why it's not been used in the 1910s, um, 20s, and 30s, um, I'm not sure. But but there's certainly some. I don't know. You don't want to make too much of these um, of, of parallels like this, of, of course. But the but the way motonashi is being used today, I mean, it's in terms of like representing a kind of essential um, and um, you know contin contiguous or continuing. Um, 
um, Japanese hospitality, which is which is um, opposed to um, notions of a, a modern Western idea of service, for example. I mean, you see this in the 1930s with the way in which hospitality in Ryokan is, um, is, is contrasted with hospitality in a Western style hotel. And, you know, Ninjo I mentioned before, but Ninjo comes up a lot in discussions of Ryokan, this idea that the, the Ryokan service is not about monetary exchanges. It's about, you know, feeling from the heart. Um, and whereas the um, Western hotel, you get efficient, very functional, very um, um, service there, which is really about tipping, for example, and tipping comes comes up a lot. But I mean, mm -hmm. of course, it's very ironic because these service manuals are really attempting to profes professionalize and rationalize the Ryokan in the same way as a, as a, as a, as a Western style hotel. I mean, the, mm. the, the guidebooks, the, the training manuals are often, you know, they approach the Ryokan and practically they approach the Ryokan and the hotel in, in very similar ways when it comes to service styles, really. Mm. Actually, that leads quite nicely into a question we have here from Gordon, who said he was struck particularly by your this integration of responsibility of the host as 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 sort of a national citizen, in terms of you know how they should behave in the opening up of their homes, and he's drawing parallels with modern day Airbnb as part of our mainstream global mm. tourist experience, and how Airbnb hosting is is that kind of performance of of you know opening up and collaboration, but at the same time it's it's competition, isn't it? So. He's asking what part competition played, um, and you know how much how much is sort of enacting the hospitality of Japan, but how much is driven by economic participation, which I think you were hinting at there. Uh, economic competition, sorry. Yes, and um, yeah, and 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 I think that that's that that's a kind of significant um, factor th throughout all this, right? I mean, while the board of tourist industry is and JTB are kind of shifting how they position tourism from the 1910s and into the 1930s. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, the, their job really is to increase tourist numbers to bring in more money. Now, how, how, how you choose to frame tourism as whether it's as like wholesome, um, you know, recreational kind of national get togethers of, of people in the mountains or whether you, you frame it as kind of modern individuals um, enjoying themselves in the 1920s, perhaps. Um, it, yeah, I mean, I think these, these businesses on the one hand and also the, these official state agencies are, are, some, are just are kind of working within the, 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 the kind of framework and pressures of, of, the, of the times they're living in, in some ways, right? And, um, and um, and yeah, I mean, and comp I mean, things like service, they become ways to to sell your, your, your business as a as a as an as a as a, as a business in it in itself. But but they but they do but but they the rhetoric of this is not in terms of the it's not in terms of tourism as a as a sector particularly. Mm. It's not in terms of individual businesses. The way they frame it is 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 you know. Is, is really in national terms from, from a relative, relatively early point. Um, mm. yeah. uh, there's a, a comment here from Quinton. Um, your talk seems to contrast with the account by Jennifer Weisenfeld about the magazine Nippon, where she described tourist promotion as an invocation for the foreigner to colonize the country with the tourist gaze. So um, he asked, to what extent were publications or tourist promoters themselves aware of this danger, while at the same time trying to shape the foreign guest? Good question there. Um, so yeah, what I'm, I mean, there's been a, there's been a lot of great research, including um, uh, Jennifer Weisenfeld's essay on 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 the tourist gaze, right, as as in focusing on representations, um, images, promotions of Japan. Um, in, in, in magazines like Nippon or, um, you know, um, tourist or, or um, um, tra travel, travel in Japan or the um, BTI magazine. And, um, and, the, and there's a lot of crossover in, in the types of things they pick up and the types of designs, um, they, uh, types of places they pick up and how they frame them, for example. Um, but um, what I'm interested, I mean, I'm 
kind of interested in I mean, this is following a lot of right, recent um, sociological research in, in tourism, looking more, turning, like moving away from tourists as a kind of disembodied gaze and thinking about, um, um, you know, the, the gaze as an embodied practice, for example, or, 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 or different senses of touch, of taste, of feel, to try to kind of see the, the tourist as a as, as, a, as a body moving in space around other bodies and in relation to other bodies here. Um, and this is, but this is quite difficult to do historically, I think. So like you, you're working with, you can't interview tourists, for example, you can't do the kind of um, ethnographic research methodologies, which, which a lot of um, tourist sociologists are, are doing, are using today. So, it, but it's kind of trying to, um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm kind of interested in these in these representations, but also in how um, how the industry and, and things like Nippon how they represented in, encounters, and can we in some way kind of recover that encounter from these documents? I mean, my last slide, which um, actually the 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 the, um, the images were from Nippon, one of the one of the great articles in Nippon. Which looked at um, like a month's tour of Japanese culture, I think. And then it's this, you know, I mean, as 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 the those Nippon articles are ah, just like wonderfully designed, really glossy, um, like map of of Japan, which showed um, little insets of the tourists going around and doing different activities. But she's with a guide there, right? I mean, it's a female tourist, and she's with a male um, mm. official guide, I would say. And but they, the way they interact together in these insets kind of gives us a sense of how it was this this relationship and that, that intimate in, um, interaction between these the guide and the and the tourist that you can see even within this kind of representation um, uh, within Nippon. I mean, I mean it, it gives. I mean it's it's a uh, they. I mean, I mean, are you? I mean, this, the idea, are you colonizing Japan with the gaze? I mean, Japan is, I would say, like working with, with signs and symbols um, in very, I mean, the Japanese agencies who are, who are designing these things, I mean, they're, they're taking and, 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 and using like very Orientalist imagery, for example, imagery which you find um, in, in, in tourism, uh, uh, promotions around the world and they they're using this and they're negotiating this and i think sometimes the meaning of these things ch changes it has to change i think with the context and and change with the reader so perhaps yes. how they're using i mean you know exoticist orientalist imagery to attract tourists to japan does that mean though that tourists are colonizing japan well i think i think it's more complicated than that actually because you know i mean the, the post colonial studies stuff on on travel writing and 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 kind of panoptical gazes and stuff i mean there has to be some kind of political order mm. which the spatial order and representative order of the text that if that doesn't align then all of a sudden that representation it's not it can't just be read as a colonization of of a place for example so you know this it's it's a I think it's quite a complex negotiation of, of signs and exchanges of signs and, 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 and the meaning of these signs can changes, I think, with the context. So I'm kind of interested in how these different impulses and uses of, of these signs and tourism and travel, how they, um, how they work in, in like a very different um, political space, right, to, um, to travel in, 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 to European travel in the European colony at the same time, mm -hmm. for example. It's quite a few questions here. Um, so continuing that theme of, you know, colony and colonies and, and empire, etc. So I'll just pick up a, a few of them, perhaps. And, you, and you, I know we've talked a little bit about Japan being an empire at this point in time. Um, so Oli Moxham asks, um, you know, when Japan was actively promoting tourism overseas as, as inter but international relations were essentially worsening between Japan and Western countries, he's just wondering about that sort of 
the influence of, of, of an increasingly, you know, nationalistic, militaristic government at home, what impact did that have on the sort of JTB rhetoric promoting, you know, Japanese tourism abroad? Uh, and then Ron asks about JTB, um, you know, when they were operating in Taiwan and Korea, you know, was this considered domestic tourism? And, you know, how was how was tourism in, in Japan and, uh, sorry, Taiwan and Korea approached in terms of the types of cultural sites that were being recommended? Or was it, you know, was it connected to the empire as domestic tourism or not? Um, uh, what was the encouragement of tourists from Taiwan to Japan, for example? So the colonies into Japan. And then finally, Janet Hunter asks, have you found any ways in which the policy towards hospitality and tourism was shaped by the experiences of them Japan, of Japanese themselves being tourists elsewhere and then and then obviously coming back so a lot of a lot of the sort of global interaction that's going on both you know within the Japanese empire of the time how was that maybe shaping the change in, in, in the policy and rhetoric going on so lots lots of questions there <laughs> Not surprising given the um, time frame that you're looking at here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, in answer to um, Oliver's question, I mean, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and explicitly, I think mm. that, but I mean, into the 1930s, to some extent after the um, invasion of Manchuria, um, certainly after the beginning, after 1937 and the outbreak of full-scale war in China, tourism is is specifically being used to as a, as a means of soft power of cultural diplomacy to offset um, negative coverage of military expansion in on the continent yeah mm. so and and these uh, what i mentioned before about the pavilions in, in new york and uh, san francisco i mean these are these are designed explicitly and specifically to to create a positive image of Japan as, as peaceful, as, uh, as benign, as, as modern, as, as just like you, um, which, yeah, and the hope is that this will, um, yeah, change public opinion, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the same for the tours, which they organized of first Americans, but then Latin America, then the first North Americans, US Americans, and then Latin Americans, um, uh, Australians, but also people from Philippines, from um, from India as well, Canadians as well, and they they, they targeted teachers, they targeted mm. um, students, they targeted writers. As a they had a long list of different categories, but basically people with um, with a platform mm. of whether that's a public platform as an essayist or or, or, or a lecturer, or, or whether like within schools to teach or to. to, to to discuss with the next generation, but it was very targeted. These tours to basically, yeah, uh, who, how, how can we best use limited resources, economic resources, to change the most people's mind, basically. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to look at the other one. Uh, yeah, I mean Taiwan and Korea. Yes. Um, uh, uh, how did JTB operate in Taiwan and Korea? Yeah, um, there's um, in the in yeah, there's it's not yeah. This is kind of Rolf has talked about this that what we really need is like a history of JTB across the <laughs> empire, mm. but it would take like you know no one person can ever do this because of the number of languages involved and the scale of it. I mean, it had M officers, 130 officers, I think including offices in New York and elsewhere in the world. Um, so yeah, I mean, JT, yeah, that, I mean, they did operate in, yeah, um, outside of the Japanese mainland. They provided guides, um, they were involved, they had an Nigel um, information booths, they provided tickets, um, yeah, all of this. Um, mm. I, but also the governor generals of, of Korea and Taiwan were involved in this, um, South Manchurian Railway, company was also involved in Manchuria. So you had different agencies who um, were, um, you know, involved and participate. And there's some, you know, obviously there's negotiations and um, different groups have different um, um, objectives sometimes. But, but increasingly in the 1930s, you have, um, I mean, the Board of Tourist Industry set up to oversee 
the tourism industry as a, as a whole in many ways, right? And then there's there's, there's organizations connected with, with it, which are dealing with all the regional um, tourism associations in Japan, for example. So there's a, I mean, as you see, I think in other aspects of what social and political life in Japan in the 30s, you see like a, a greater and greater um, top-down control over um, tourism, mm. yeah. Well, I mean, it's such a massive project, isn't it? I mean, you're focusing on specifically inbound, <laughs> inbound uh, but lots of questions here about outbound as well. A um, question here from Heather, who's SOAS alumni. Uh, she's talking about um, the book Petticoat Vagabond in Ainu land, mm -hmm. thinking about the pictures and passages from that. And so she's asking, were there any particular instructions or guides given to people who were ethnically Ainu? And if so, you know, what, what, how is it asking them to mobilize their identity, even though their identity was actively sort of, you know, mm -hmm. discriminated against or regulated in, in Japanese mm -hmm. uh, national culture or policy? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, the, 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 the tourists, foreign tourists who are taken, who go to Hokkaido or taken to Hokkaido, I mean, they're, they're, um, they're usually taken to the, you know, the kind of model Ainu tourist village in Shirai, Shirai is it? I'm, I'm forgetting, I'm sorry. Um, but, um, um, and, and this was, you know, I mean, this is a place which Isabella Bird had visited in the 1880s, right? Mm. But it becomes this, this um, I mean, and she's been recommended to go there as well as like the place where you'll find Kind of Ainu, authentic Ainu culture, um, etc. But it becomes more and more to touristified. That um, and and when when um, when uh, Neil James is going there, right in 1940 or something. I mean, by that stage, it's 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 a site which domestic Japanese tourists are visiting in huge huge numbers. But some um, there is a great um article on this and um, and i can't quite remember the 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 author or the, the title of it quite now but he looks at the production of ainu as a as a tourist resource and looks at the discussions that were happening within um and and within ainu communities about this and also um, with ainu communities and the 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 larger um wajin or whatever community um, or, or, or people outside that. And the Ainu leaders are saying quite specifically, we don't want to be used like this. Mm -hmm. Like um, there's all this, I mean, there's all this pressure on the Ainu community to be, um, to be, um, you know, so-called progressive, to, to become modern and, and Japanese and things. And this village is, is, is a, um, you know, it's an obstacle in these, in these attempts to, it, this is because the village is, you know, traditional Ainu life. It's, um, you know, as it supposedly was, has been lived until until colonization, basically. I mean, so they're very involved, the Ainu, the Ainu community and the leaders that are very involved with with how they were being represented, but had relatively little power, right? I mean, to, to change that, to affect that representation. Mm. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean it's it's it's, it's interesting. Though. I'm not sure if this is the case with Japanese tourists, that, but almost always the the foreign tourists they they want to build this um this close relationship with the Ainu. Like I mean, I guess maybe this is part <laughs> of like seeing behind the scenes in some ways of tourism, but um but I mean from Isabella Bird onwards, I mean she's not necessarily the, the first, but. Yeah, there's attempts to build close, intimate relations with the Ainu, which are somehow perhaps in opposition to 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 the Japanese guides, for example, or or, or on a larger scale Japanese colonization, perhaps. And um, yeah, but, but but there's a lot of difference depending on on, on individual differences, there, of course. Mm. There's an um, interesting comment and an offer here from Pamela, who says um, her American family lived in Yokohama from 1945 to 1962, and 
um, were not treated as residents, but were rather treated as honoured guests. And, and of course, that was during the occupation as well. So she said, if you'd like some photos of some handbooks that she's got on how to be a GI or how to be an American family in Japan at that time, uh, perhaps we can link you up. But did, are you aware of those types? That's not really inbound tourism as such, is it? It's sort of short term residence. But you know how to how that's a sort of reverse how to be a foreigner while in Japan <laughs> guidebook, which is interesting um, comparison to what you've been. That'd be doing. very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, some, sounds, thank you very much. That'd yeah. Very well, we can uh, we can link up afterwards, Pamela. I'll link you to because mm. uh, she has another specific question about your one of your references as well. So perhaps we can link you up afterwards. That would be great. Um, if you contact me at the JRC, Pamela. Um. Uh, my colleague Verity is picking up on uh, adding to my sports question. I think you did speak about this, but any insight into winter sports and connection to tourism hotspots in, in Japan? I mean, Hokkaido is an obvious one and has really taken off in recent years as well. But I don't know back then to what extent, you know, winter sports and, and winter based tourism hotspots in Japan. Mm. Yeah, um, well, like, yeah, like I said, there is the, yeah, the huge push and a lot of the JTB ads um, through the 30s have skiing, focus on skiing, basically, like come in winter and, um, you know, um, great snow, um, great facilities, just like Europe, um, but with an onsen afterwards is, is one of the kind of key um, 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 uh, promotional phrases or slogans that just kind of picking up like the guidebook from the 1940s to see if I could quickly find something on winter sports and <laughs> where, again where we, can, we can connect you up afterwards if you'd like yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 so perhaps maybe just one last question because I'm aware of the time but um I think you did mention this, but I don't know if you want to add a bit more. Jola asks, um, thank you. Well, says thank you for the fascinating talk, which many people have said. Wondering whether you could compare the experience of the Meiji period visitors and the hosts with those visiting in the later time period you're looking at. So, for example, did they have access to guidebooks and was there, you know, any investment in, in acting as a host or in, that, in that period? I think you did mention that briefly, but mm -hmm. perhaps if you want to add in. Yeah. Um, in terms of guidebooks, um, yeah, you, I mean, the big shift that occurs into the 20th century is that um, Japanese um, organizations take over basically um, promotional strategies and, and guidance strategies for Japan, right? I mean, there are, there's Terry's guidebook to the Japanese empire, which continues into the 20s, perhaps 30s, but the Murray's handbook, I think the last edition of the Murray's handbook is 19. 13 maybe or something like that um but, but i mean the, the first one being sometime in the 18 1870s i think so yeah but it but it, it's 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 foreigners particularly resident foreigners i mean basil hall chamberlain right a japanologist and, and professor and uh of literature japanese mm -hmm. literature at tokyo university i mean he's he he's the author right of one of you know the murray's handbook for many years um um, Ernest Sato writes guidebooks to Nikko and um, uh, does he write one to Tokyo? I can't remember. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's foreigners there, and it's uh, and it's a lot of foreigners in the treaty ports who own and set up the hotels, for example, things like that. Um, and I, I yeah, and I think the the tourists are they have they come with different um, expectations, and they come with. Um, you know, I mean, speaking very generally, but with different types of stereotypes and different, um, a different sense of their own. Um, I mean, you know, there's many exceptions to this, but a sense of their own superiority, mm. the sense that they can, uh, they they can, you know, they have the right to go wherever they want to. I mean, you know, there's plenty of examples of, you know, of of foreign tourist groups in in Meiji with people, you know seeing a temple with a with a um with a service going on inside the guide saying look you can't go in now and they're like well we're going in there right we want to see this and they're just barreling in there and stuff so, i mean there's lots of examples of not of course of tourists not but i think yeah there's a there's a different relationship there to japan and a different image i mean you know the same things fujisan etc i mean they they continue throughout but but a different yeah sense of of, of 
of of like um relation i mean relations as 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 modern subjects as as um as as you know yeah as as participants in 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 the modern i think and that mm. in the 20s and 30s is much more prevalent and you you know you don't see that in the same way i think in the early and mid meiji period in particular um yeah i'm not sure there's a lot more to could be said but about that great well, well, thank you to everybody who who posed um, questions. We we had over a hundred participants here tonight, so really grateful. Uh, and sorry if we didn't get to answer your question, but we will be giving um, Elliot the full chat there. So um, if anybody wants to connect with me um, or Elliot via myself, please please do send on your your question or comment. And thanks so much, um, Elliot. It was fascinating. When when can we expect the book to come out? I'm sure, like the rest of us, uh, lockdown and having children at home has kind of put a little bit of a dampener on the writing. But when when might we expect the book on this topic to come um, out? Yes, yeah. <laughs> no this pressure. Is the, the, dreaded, the dreaded question, of course. <laughs> Perhaps uh, we'll just leave that hanging. Well, we can all look out for the book. I mean, <laughs> yes, in a year or two or three. Let's say. <laughs> in the meantime, thank you, you very much. Articles. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah okay, thank you very brilliant. Much. So, lots of comments saying question. it was fascinating. And yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, brilliant. Okay, uh, so we're back next week and the week after. Um, so do tune in again if you've enjoyed this seminar. But once again, thanks to Elliot for a fascinating insight. Um, and um, have a good evening, everybody, or morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you. <laughs>